and welcome back to another episode of Grassroots Racer. This week's guest has been involved in motorsports for a long time in lots of different ways and I can't wait to hear about his experiences overseas as well as in Australia. It's a big welcome to Tony Mason. So how are you tonight, Tony? I'm really, really, really good. Thanks, Hetton. How are you doing? I'm great, Tony, and thanks so much for joining me tonight. Now, where did you get, you know, your love for motorsports? Where did it all begin and did you race yourself? Uh, I did, um, but but I, I didn't get going on that until I was about 24, which was a bit late for it to ever become probably too serious. But uh, uh, look, in terms of having the love for it, um, honestly, mate, I... Um, I would have to say, even as a even as a little kid, you know, I've got a photograph of me about three years old standing on my grandfather on the seat of my grandfather's car, holding the steering wheel. It, you know, I could, you you probably understand this. Every car going the other way, you could tell what it is and all that sort of stuff. Mm. But I have to say, um, really, for me to start with, motorcycles was the thing that really interested me. So. Um, you know, I used to work when I, when I was sort of 13, I used to work at a motorcycle shop um, after school one day a week and on a Saturday morning. And we had a couple of, you know, bikes that um, were, you know, raced, speedway and road racing that were prepared out of our workshop, out of the out of the dealership's workshop. And I stopped growing when I was 13. So um, I used to be able to throw my leg quite illegally over a, over a road bike and even go and do some things on the road you're not meant to do. But back in those days, you could do that sort of stuff. But then we, we moved to Melbourne. The family moved to Melbourne when I was 15. And um, I got I got caught up with a bad crowd. They were into car racing. Um, and it all just went downhill from there. Um, so yeah, I, 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 um, I, I can still remember, if you, if you watched the movie Rush, I would imagine you would have. Yeah. Well, that uh, that Japanese Grand Prix where um, Nicky Lauda retired and James Hunt won the World Championship was actually telecast into Australia, and I can remember watching that. Um, I'm pretty sure it was highlights rather than the whole race, but, you know, so I really got into it all around then. Um, I really, um, I wanted, I, I, I felt the desire to sort of compete, but... I suppose a confidence thing or whatever. I had friends who were members of the Phillip Island Auto Racing Club, and I joined that. And used to go along to race meetings and the as, as an official, which was always a good thing to do because um, you get closer to the action than anyone else. You don't pay to get in, and they actually feed you lunch. So, you know, we used to be able to, and, and it was just a really good seen in those days everyone you know like a lot of good friends and friendships that i still many of them still last till today you know and that was my late teens and i'm not going to admit how old i am but i've been around long enough and i'm ugly enough that yeah it's it's really good to still have those friendships so yeah from a grassroots point of view i can remember being down at phillip island and doing working bees and working on the track and helping build tire walls that were there for a very long time um but yeah so that was so the officiating side of things was was good for particularly for big race meetings to be able to be part of those um um, but i started uh i was looking around for the right car to to compete in for a little while and i I bought a couple of different things that i thought might be right but they just weren't Mm. and sold those and i bought an escort twin cam when i was i don't know 23 something like that and um spent a bit of time getting it it was pretty good when i when i got it but it needed to be needed a few things done to it to really make it suitable and i and i started doing um club sprints and hill climbs and and i and i kind of the thing to me with grassroots level racing is it's a it's not about going out and trying to win everything although the natural competitor in you does want to do that but it's about improving yourself and challenging yourself. And uh, so my view was very much, I just had what I had. I wanted to not spend money on the car um, to make it faster until I felt I'd got the most out of what I had. 
so I had to improve myself as a driver and that uh, that was a pretty good approach to take but didn't always work because the downside to that is sometimes you can overdrive what you've got so there were a few crashes along the way but that's part of motorsport and um, yeah you know like I really enjoyed doing it I was a member of, also of the Ford 4 car club and and that was a very strong club I mean car clubs these days Ed, and I don't think they're really quite the same but this was, and I know you're going to be shocked by this, mate, but this was before the internet. So there was no internet. There were no computers with these huge rooms in the basement of a building, you know, full of big reels and, you know, there were no mobile phones. There was no social media. Um, so we used to go to a club meeting every, every month um, to get together and there'd be, I don't know, between 150, between 100, maybe 150 people would turn up to every club meeting, all with our cars, all shooting the breeze. And it was just a really good, social, fun time. And we go away and compete together as well. Yeah, so you've covered a lot there, Tony. Um, and just for those who don't know, Rush was a movie about James Hunt and Nicky Lauder's uh, rivalry in Formula One. It's pretty good. I recommend watching it. So, you know, you said you sometimes bought different cars, jumped from different car to car. Um, I can admit, me and my dad have like had the same issue in a sense. Like we're trying to find the right car to race at the moment. Uh, we yep. picked up an Alfa Romeo race car, which hopefully, you know, is going to work out really well. But yep. you know, suits level racing is really about going out and having fun. Um, you did mention to me that you did some volunteering at the first mm -hmm. Adelaide Grand Prix. So have you got any yep. memories from that time? Yeah, well, the, um, the, the, the Adelaide Grand Prix, um, the, there were a number of different bodies and people worked on making that happen. It wasn't just people from South Australia. And um, one of the things we'd done here, actually here in Victoria was we'd run the Australian Grand Prix, the local version of it, um, from 1980 through to 1984 at Calder, but we ran it to FIA regulations rather than the local CAMS regulations. And they're really very different in terms of how you run a race meeting. So in the first year was for Formula 5000s and Alan Jones and Bruno Giacomelli came out with their Formula 1 cars and raced against the 5000s and that was pretty cool. Uh, and then the following years, it was for Formula Pacific cars, which was what was racing as the top level of open wheeler racing in Australia. And, and Bob Jane, I have to say, did a huge amount to contribute to, I think, what led to the Formula One race happening because he just was getting a whole crew of Formula One drivers into the country to drive these Formula Pacifics, which is pretty rare to see them you know prost rossberg pk you know oh, heaps more alan jones of course lafitte i think from memory but he but he got in heaps of of the current formula one drivers and it wasn't just formula one drivers from down the back of the grid these were right these were people who were right up the front very big names here in australia um racing in formula pacific and that was a big deal um so there were there were a group of us who were working as officials at calder and because we were the only people in the country who'd run races to the fia um, regulations um, there was a steering group of us we used to meet it at, at, on a wednesday night at cam's headquarters it, uh, it feels like it was every week it probably wasn't it was probably once a month or once a fortnight but we planned out everything in terms of how the, the Grand Prix was going to be run from an officiating point of view. And we were dealing with the South Australian Officials Association um, and essentially saying, look, these are the things you need to do, um, which they did because they had no experience of running race meetings to the FIA uh, rules. And uh, virtually all the senior officials in those first few Grand Prix anyway, because um, I went overseas after that. But certainly all the senior officials, or I think all, nearly all of them, were in fact from Melbourne because that's where the knowledge base was and that continued on. So 
So, yeah, that's kind of, I was there in the, I, I, you know, part of what I did was run the, the pit lane and the grid um, officials. And I was there working in pit lane and talking to um, team members from Formula One teams. And uh, that discussion naturally led to how to get a, a gig. And essentially they said, you've got to be in England. You know, it's, um, you've probably done enough that you could work your way to Formula One, but you've got to be in England. You won't ever get a job applying from Australia. Um, so that's another part of the story. But that was, uh, it was incredible to be there for that first, for that first, uh, that first Grand Prix in 85. And, and um, you know, I have to say, you know, we, we only started getting Grand Prix on TV here. Uh, I think it was 1980. I think it was the year that Alan Jones won the World Championship. We started getting them. Up until then, other than that Japanese race, you, you might get the odd uh, set of the BBC highlights and that'd be it. But we started getting the races live in, might have been, might have been 81, but it was certainly around that point. So, and they were very, very strong rating. They were, uh, uh, they were so popular. Uh, I think it was at one stage there, it was the most expensive airtime to buy for advertising if you wanted to get to a male market. And it was on at 11 o'clock at night on a Sunday. So it was a pretty big deal. So when it, when it happened, I can remember um, I was working and I, and I couldn't get into Adelaide until quite late relatively. So I got in on Thursday morning. And um, so I missed just the start, the very start of the first day. I remember getting in the taxi, getting in a taxi at the airport to get myself over to where the track was, and you could hear the cars from the airport really clearly, you know. Wow. Um, and it was honestly, it was one of those sort of goosebump moments, um, having wanted to see them for real and work so hard and towards helping make it happen because the hundreds of people were involved in, thousands of people probably involved in making it happen. So to be part of that group and to to actually hear them and then obviously see them for real was pretty incredible, really. It must have been incredible. I I've been lucky enough to go to a Formula One Grand Prix. I went back in two thousand eighteen, and um, I wasn't quite lucky enough to hear the F one cars driving around when I was pulling in, but there were some Ferraris going around, so it yep. was pretty amazing. But I remember yep. the V eight supercars at Melbourne. When they were downshifting, it was so loud. It was incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so you said that you were sort of speaking to some people in Formula One and you said you had to, you know, be in England to sort of have a chance of getting into yep. a team. What, when did you sort of go, okay, I'm going to go to England and I'm going to try and get to a Formula One team? Um, well, I was, I was, you know, it was, I, I, I'd been spending everything I, I earned on racing um, myself. Um, I'd, I'd sold my car because I'd, I had an intention of getting a, a little open wheeler, a um, little Formula Ford. Um, I had a sponsor who had to pull the pin and I was left a bit high and dry. And, and so I'd, I'd stopped racing um, and was at a bit of a crossroads with it. And I'd, uh, I was working in the automotive industry and, and, and um, I'd left, I was working for Mercedes Benz at factory level in, uh, at head office. And I wanted to get retail experience. So I was um, selling cars at Ken Morgan Toyota and, and I'd done that and knew I could sell them. And I was thinking, okay, what I was at a bit of a crossroads with my career as well. So I was thinking, oh, I want to stay in retail, do I want to do this, do I want to do that. Anyway, so everything was at a crossroads. And and I made the decision that if I, whatever I was going to do next, I'd commit to for a number of years. At that stage, I was, you know, 26. And um, and I thought, if I'm going to go to England, I either go now or don't go for at least five or six years and it might not happen. Um, so I decided to go to England. Um, I'm fortunate in that my dad's from over there. Um, uh, you know, like essentially, I'm a Shetland Islander from back from a background point of view on my dad's side. So I was born over there. Uh, came came to Australia when I was like two years old. My mum's from here. 
Um, so I had, I could have a British passport and could come and go as often as I like, whereas a lot of Australians, you know, you've got to get a visa and you can only be there for two years and, and unless your employer lets you, you know, fills out different documents for you to stay longer. So I could just go. So I got a one-way ticket and I went to, went to England. And I thought, look, I'll have a crack at this and if it doesn't work out, I'll just have a holiday and then I'll come home. So um, that's what I did. And um, I, I, I think the second day I was there, I applied for a job with Autosport magazine, and that's the Bible, weekly magazine over there, motorsport magazine. And they wanted people to sell advertising in the back of the magazine, and they were always advertising, you know, because it's just not a fun job. People do it and get burnt out. So I, I took on that job, which meant that I earned a little bit from it, but I also got to get my hands on the magazine a day before it hit the newsstands. So, um, yeah, I, I saw jobs advertised and one of them was with Rolt Cars. So Rolt um, is, was well, he's no longer with us, but was Ron Torinac. So he was Jack Brabham's partner and designer of the cars back in the, the, the Brabham days when Jack was you know, running the team. And Ron ended up owning the team and he sold it to Bernie Eccleston. And then some years later, he started up Rolt, which was his own um, operation. And uh, it was, Rolt was actually based at the old Brabham factory at Newhall in Weybridge in Surrey. Anyway, so they were advertising for people to build Formula 3 cars for the upcoming season. They build 30 or 40 cars for customer teams. So I went along and I, I, you know, had an interview and they gave me a job. So I was there working, building Formula 3 cars with, you know, you start off putting together brake lines and they see you can do that properly and then they get you to move to the next level and it doesn't take long and you're assembling the cars. So that was how it all started over there. Did you ever go from assembling the car to a race weekend with a team? Yeah, yeah. I, I actually... Um, the very last car we built in the in the build that season was for West Surrey Racing, which was probably the leading Formula 3 team, certainly in the UK and I'd suggest in Europe at the time, or certainly one of the top two or three. Um, and uh, the last car we built was a special one that Ron did as a development car with a six-speed gearbox, which was a pretty radical thing at the time, and, and a number of other trick things on it. So I built that. And the guy who owns West Surrey Racing is a Kiwi called Dick Bennett's, and he was in looking at the car, and and he said to me, so what are you doing when the build finishes? And I said, well, you know, I guess I'm done. And he said, oh, okay. Um, he said, can you drive a truck? And I said, yeah, yeah, I, that's right. You know, when I worked for Mercedes, it was commercial vehicles. I've been around them and driven them. And he said, well, you know, we need someone to drive our truck and to look after this car some of the time, would you like to come and work for us? So that's what I did. So, um, man, I've got to tell you, I, so I finished at Rolt building the car and then we finished, I finished the car, went over to West Surrey, you know, and, and I resigned from Rolt. So I finished the car, went over to West Surrey Racing, picked up the team transporter, brought it back, picked the car up and my toolbox and all the rest of it and then headed back over there. Um, and uh, I couldn't tell you what day of the week that was, but the following week we were testing at Silverstone and I can remember standing on the pit wall at Silverstone wearing all this red and white Marlborough World Championship team uniform because the team was sponsored by Marlborough or one of the cars was, and um, watching this little Formula 3 car zap around the track, having to sort of pinch myself to really believe that I was at Silverstone and I hadn't ever been there before. Um, so I was at Silverstone on the other side of the world and midweek testing and I was getting paid. Whereas, you know, here in Australia, if I was going to go testing my car or help someone with theirs, I'd have to take a day off work. So it was a big change, but a good one. Definitely. So did you in, enjoy the truck driving? Because I know truck driving can sometimes be a bit of a, 
bit tiring because you're driving long hours, but did you enjoy the, always the end result of ending up at a, a new track or ending up at a famous track? Yeah, I've got to say it. And I mean, it's, if you want to really, look, it's the way they run the teams these days is very different. So, um, but, but when I was doing it, we do what we do, we drove, you know, in my case, drove the truck. Um, but then when, and did all the customs documentation and the stocking of the parts and, you know, all the, all the logistical stuff involved with, you know, having, having everything the team needed. But then, um, when you get to the track, um, you've got work in this case, Formula three, you know, this, this, you know, I was the one who knew where, what parts we had and where they were, um, getting tyres fitted and there was a whole palaver because they were cross-ply tyres for Formula 3. So there was a whole palaver with pressuring them and measuring them and re-measuring and matching sets and all sorts of stuff. Um, fuel. So you, the days were um, filled. You know, they were, they were not out of control long days at the workshop, although they sometimes were. Um, but mostly we'd be sort of working pretty long days but not not outrageous so you do you know 11 12 hours most days 10 between 10 and 12 i suppose but when we got busy it'd be a lot more um and of course race weekend so there'd be a lot of hours but driving the truck around because the thing with driving a truck which is easy to forget is you're up so high you see a lot of things that people driving cars don't see and i've got to tell you mate it's a great way to see europe it's a great way to see the UK, um, and um, I enjoyed it immensely. You know, it it really was a great thing to do, um, and uh, you know, we got into all sorts of tricky situations at times. You know, with um, not so much that year, but um, when I was doing Formula Three Thousand, you know, we used to go and race it um, at a track called Enna down in Sicily and um, you know we had a couple of pretty interesting experiences with getting the getting the race transporters down to down to Sicily and you know taxes in inverted commas that little men with handguns want you to pay so you can even get on the ferry and because you know there's a fair bit of mafia uh, stuff goes on down there didn't always happen but it did happen um, so yeah there was all sorts of weird things and it just made it I've got to say, it was work. We worked long hours, um, but it was a big adventure as well. Yeah, and after doing Formula 3 for a while, when did you sort of get your opportunity to, I'm guessing, move straight to Formula 1? Or uh, I did Formula 3000 first. So um, uh, it's a little bit of a long story, but essentially, and I'll try and keep it really short, um, did Formula 3 for one season. We came, we finished second in the British Formula 3 Championship with Bertrand Gasho. Um, we also ran Roland Ratzenberger, who unfortunately was killed the day before your namesake, Ayrton Senna, uh, at Imola. Actually, there you go. That's, there's a photo of, of Roland right above my head as, as I'm talking. Um, yep. So he was he was someone we all considered to be a good friend. I mean, we had really good times together. But but at the end of that year, we um, we tested a bunch of drivers, and Eddie, Eddie Irvine got the drive for the following year. Um, and uh, but at the start of the season, you know, we'd worked all winter. We had a pretty tough winter. We had a new truck that needed to be fitted out, and I was pretty burnt out, I have to say. And and um, there was one of the guys on the team, a Kiwi guy, had 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 left. Um, and he was working for a Formula 3000 team and he gave me a call because they needed someone who could drive the truck and work on the car a little bit and do a few other things. And he said, look, you know, Formula 3000, there's a lot less races than Formula 3. It's enjoyable. They're good people here. Come on, come and do it. And I did. So I left West Surrey Racing and I went and worked for a, uh, a little one car Formula 3000 team. We didn't have a lot of money. Um, Guy who owned it was another Kiwi called, you know, Kiwis everywhere. Uh, another guy called a guy called Don Halliday, and he had been essentially Gordon Murray's number two at Brabham. So he was an engineer and, and design guy, very very clever guy. You know, he uh, designed a pretty effective um, Indy car for Craco, um, and he did a lot of spent a lot of years in the states after, 
you know, that year that, that we worked together. And he was a very, he's won a lot of races as an engineer. He's a very, very smart little guy. Um, so we, we had, a, we had a, a Spanish driver driving for us. And he struggled, to be fair. He was a little bit older and um, compared to the young guys, and he was quick. But the difference with being in your early 30s compared to the guys in your early 20s is just how hard you're prepared to push the car. So we had a reasonably tough year. We only got into about half the races. Um, because Formula 3000 in those days, 26 cars start the race, and about 43 would turn up to every race meeting. So was it... So, yeah. So was it a bit of like an elimination process, like you do heat one and then if you finish outside the top, whatever, you'd be knocked out? Not even that. It was it all happened in qualifying. So what they used to do is they'd split the field into half based on odd numbers and even numbers. So you'd have practice sessions for odd numbers, practice sessions for even numbers, then qualifying the same. And the best 13 even-numbered cars lined up next to the best 13 odd-numbered cars, and that was it. So you could you we we were going all over Europe, and it's you know it's not cheap. We we're going all over Europe attempting to get into races. So you could go to a race meeting, have your sponsors there, and all that sort of thing. You could practice and qualify, but if you had a problem in qualifying, you'd miss out, and uh, you're not taking part in the race. So you know that was um, pretty tough. You needed you needed commercial backers who were genuinely behind you. Um, and you know we had that for our for our single driver. He was a you know, guy called Furman Velleth. He'd uh, he'd been very effective in sports cars, and he was after that. But he was, you know, he was Spain's I think first ever world champion. He was world C two uh, sports car champion, and um, he had a pretty good life. And I think at thirty three, I think he was at the time, um, compared to these guys who were 22, 23, in a high risk situation where there's a wall coming up, he would lift off and be smart, whereas they just didn't. And uh, he was generally about a second off the pace of the cars at the front, but that was the difference between the front of the grid and the back of the grid in Formula 3000 then. So um, it, it, we, we didn't get into all the races and we had a few problems. I mean, there's actually a photo again, right above my head. That's us at Silverstone. We just, we just uh, dropped a valve in the engine in the in the rain so in qualifying so that was a wasn't a good scene so I'm just, um yeah those cars look a bit like uh well that one above your head actually looks a bit like senna's tolman in a way um so were they close to an f1 car desired well believe it or not you you'd think they would be because back then a uh, former 3000 cars the the quick cars were quick enough to get onto the back of the formula one grid so, you know, the, the qualifying times at the same circuits, you know, the leading cars in Formula 3000 would be around about P22 or something on the Formula 1 grid. So they were pretty quick. But when you actually look at them closely, they were more like a grown-up Formula 3 car. So um, there was a really big jump in the design and the quality of materials and just the the detail between Formula 3000 and Formula 1. And, and they certainly had a lot, lot less wing and a lot less tyre. So, um, you know, when you, so they, a, a, a Formula 3000 car essentially was like a Formula 3 car with a slightly enlarged tub, um, a three litre V8 bolted onto the back of it. Um, the wheels were wider than Formula 3, but again, closer to Formula 3 than the Formula 1 at the time. And the wings, in reality, were really, there wasn't a lot of them. So they were a pretty challenging car to drive. Um, you needed to really hang it out there. It was a Formula 3 car had only about 150 horsepower. So you had much more grip and much more aero grip than you had power. So you had to drive within that and be very smooth. A Formula 3000 car was kind of the reverse. Um, didn't have a lot of grip, didn't have a lot of aero grip, but it had, uh, depending on who you listen to, they were around about four, somewhere between 450 and 500 horsepower, limited to 9,000 RPM, but they were proper racing engines, Cosworths and Mugens primarily, Judds as well. Um, and um, so you could very easily get them out of shape. 
and hang them out and and essentially drift the cars. Obviously, you know, that would affect your speed, but you could do that. So it was quite a different skill to drive them. And um, I think it's all part of the balance as you come up through different formula. You've got to have different skills each time and you've got to master that. So by the time you get to Formula One, you've sort of mastered all of them, if that makes sense. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching that episode of Grassroots Racer. Now, unfortunately, that was only part one. So stay tuned for next Friday when we'll release part two of our chat to Tony. Now guys, there was a lot there, but I'm telling you, Tony has a lot more to talk about in part two. So guys, stay tuned and I'll see you then. Thank you.